Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night service. For those of you that are with me, it's right now Tuesday night, but for those watching in, it's Wednesday night, and we're going to start singing number 422, Yesterday, Today, Forever. And then stand and sing. Oh, how sweet the glorious message simple faith can be claimed. Yesterday, tonight by uh, hearing the word of God and by um, singing these songs of praise to thee. Pray, Lord, that you'll make us more like our Savior. And if there's someone that doesn't know our wonderful Savior, I pray that today will be their day of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for standing. Please be seated. Anybody with a favorite tonight? Brandon. 515? 515. Near the cross.
I sang verse three again. I think we need to sing verse four, right? Yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah. Okay. But Erica, well, you had your hand up too. Oh, sorry we'll go to Erica next. Okay, 805. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thank you. 
or dying, may honor be thine. From this wretched life you loved and forgave. A life that is on fire, the only our hearts desire. Be faithful from now to the In my car. In my car. That rings a melody. Oh, that's a good one. All right, 871, and uh, this will be our last one, but we'll remain seated because you're going to be standing in a minute for reading the Bible. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and redo it. I just wasn't ready. I was, yeah. smelling savor in thy sight, Lord, and I pray that though I just will be blessed for singing them, and I pray that now, Lord, you'll prepare our hearts for thy word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for singing this evening. Good to have so many voices to sing with, you know, yeah. and uh, it's a blessing. Uh, just for your announcements, remember that uh, this Sunday we will have our uh, drive-in service again, because I personally have found that that's a blessing, and I trust that it's been a blessing to you. And so this Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, we'll be in the parking lot, parked six feet apart, and to have our drive-in service, unless, of course, they decide to give us more liberties. If they give us more liberties, then by all means, we'll be here in the church building. But uh, for now, we'll take what we got and uh, look forward to seeing you in the parking lot on Sunday. Uh, just a reminder that on Friday morning, is when uh, we have the Sunday night service. I know it's a weird time for Sunday night, it's Friday morning, but uh, it's just that way we can get it to YouTube and uh, Facebook on time. I know Friday is a work day, so it's harder for people to make it there, but I'm starting to go through repeats for, uh, for coming to the services because there's not many people that have expressed an interest in coming. So if you'd like to come either on Friday morning or if you know, would like to come the next Tuesday night, Please reach out, let me know, and we can uh, accommodate, you know, we can just 
find a cycle if we need to, you know, and it, make sure we get everybody into a service at this time. So um, those are my announcements. Uh, other than that, let's take our Bibles and go to uh, first or Second Corinthians chapter ten this evening. Second Corinthians chapter ten. When you find your spot, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Not that I don't enjoy seeing these uh, you know, faces for a second time, but I've seen them for a second time, you know. Uh, but uh, we, of course, want to encourage everybody to be able to come at this time. So if anybody is sitting there and like, I'd like to get to one of those, then by all means, reach out, and we'd love to see your face at one of these services. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to read the whole chapter tonight, but I don't think I'll be able to finish the chapter tonight. But uh, we'll see how far we go. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we've been going through 2 Corinthians on Wednesday nights. And uh, let's look at chapter 10 tonight. Now I, Paul, beseech myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. For we do not make ourselves of the number, to, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of things without our measure, that is of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Let's ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage of scripture that's before us this evening and thank you Lord for the testimony of the Apostle Paul and how even though they um, they scoffed at his presence in their pre presence among them he was really just showing them Christ likeness and I pray Lord that today we will um, show people what Jesus looks like I pray Lord that although it might not be popular although it might be despised by many I pray, Lord, that we will be Christ-like in our appearance, in our manner, and how we act. Pray, Lord, for the spirit of meekness, Lord, that that's what we'll have tonight. Pray, Lord, for myself, that you'll fill me with your spirit, Lord, to preach the word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. 
Today we're thinking of perhaps the most honorable and yet one of the most despised of all virtues. It's a virtue. It's a commendable virtue. It's something that if you're like this, you, it's, a, it's an added attribute of Christ-likeness. And yet when someone possesses this virtue, they are despised. They are criticized. They are belittled. They are mocked. They are scoffed. They are mistreated by society when they possess this virtue. What virtue is it? It's the virtue of meekness. No other virtue I, that I see in the Bible is so belittled as the virtue of meekness. Perhaps there's no, yet at the same time, perhaps there's not a virtue that someone can have that's more Christ-like. To be meek is to be like Jesus. And Paul says so in our text. He beseeches them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Jesus was meek. Jesus is meek. He's the perfect example of meekness. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus, our Savior, was meek. He showed this gentle spirit. He was lowly in heart. And when we're meek, we're like Jesus, our Savior. We're Christ-like. And it's a most honorable virtue. And yet you look at history, and you look at the Bible especially, and you see that all those examples of meek men, all those examples that you see of meekness, you see over and over and over again that others looked at that meek man and they despised him. They didn't like meekness. Moses was the meekest man in all the earth, the Bible says in Numbers chapter 12. No one was as meek as Moses. And his own brother and sister spoke against him and despised him in that chapter. David, I see David as someone who was meek in a lot of ways. He showed his meekness, and yet Saul was chasing him into caves and mountains. In later years, two of his own sons would rise up in rebellion against him. Meekness has been despised all down through the ages, just as our Savior was despised. You remember how they treated him. He was the meekest. He said, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and learn of me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And our meek Savior, the mob, cried, Crucify him. They spat on his face. They crowned him with a crown of thorns. They led him out of the city to be crucified. That's how they treated the man of sorrows, who was meek and lowly in heart. And that's what we see in our world today, don't we? Someone's really meek, that's despised, that's looked down upon. What, what are you doing with that demeanor, with that spirit of meekness? Not much has changed. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, as Paul is dealing with the Corinthians and talking about his spirit of meekness, beseeching them with meekness and gentleness that there were some in that church that despised him because of his meekness. They despised him because he was gentle. Because when he was in their presence, he, was, he, he walked softly, you might say. He led by compassion and with gentleness and meekness. And they despised him. Now, it wasn't the whole church. We've just gone through nine chapters of 2 Corinthians. And in those nine chapters, yes, Paul dealt with a few things, but he was speaking to believers that loved him, a church of people that, that had repented of a previous sin and had gotten right with God, and he had just encouraged them to give. In chapter 7, he was just rejoicing in, in the Corinthians and who they were in his relationship with them. He's been talking to the whole church in those first nine chapters. But now in chapter 10 to the rest of the chapter, he turns and looks at those that are causing the problems. He's talking to those who are accusing him, talking to those who have been opposing him right there in Corinth. And this is what they've been despising. 
They've been saying, you say that Paul's a leader? You say he's a strong leader? I mean, he's a weak man. He's not anybody to follow. That Paul, you think he's, you think he's a, a, a apostle of Christ? I mean, we have letters from Jerusalem. We have letters of commendation. We're way better than Paul. What are you doing listening to that Paul? Why do you hear him preach? Why do you listen, read his letters? I mean, he writes a letter, and his letter, he's, he's weighty and powerful in verse number 10. But his bodily presence is weak. His speech is contemptible. He's not anybody you should be following. What was it that they were despising? It was his meek nature, his meek heart. And we've been looking at the heart of a preacher. And as we look at Paul this evening, we're reminded of his meek heart. Here he is facing his accusers, facing those who are aggressive against him, those who are attacking him. And how does he approach them? In verse number one, now I, Paul, myself, one-on-one, -on -one, he, he directly approaches them. I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He was coming towards them meekly, gently, in the gentleness of Christ. And he speaks, I believe the rest of that verse there is, uh, is him quoting what they say of him, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you, he says, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. And now as we go through this chapter, we see him addressing his accusers, his adversaries. And I want you to notice his meekness in this chapter, how he approached them with meekness. And this is you're going to get to the end of this, and you're going to say, Pastor Luke, where was the meekness? You said this is the meekness of Paul. Well, we'll see it. I'll, I'll remind you of it at the end again. But as we go through this, number one, we see the power of Paul. The power of Paul. And I know talking about meekness, you say, well, that just doesn't make sense. We're talking about someone that's meek. We're not thinking of someone who's powerful. Well, not big letter A, we see the declaration of his power. The declaration of his power. Paul basically says, they have questions about my authority, about my power. Well, I can show you if you'd like, but I'd rather not. <laughs> I'd rather not show you my power. We see in this text the power of Paul who is meek. And so let's just be clear about this. Meekness is not weakness. Someone says a person that's meek is someone who's weak. I actually looked the meekness up in the dictionary just a little while ago, and uh, I was surprised to see that today's dictionary defines meekness as weakness, defines it as someone who is weak, as someone that is meek. That's not what the Bible says. That's not the old meaning of the word. That's just a reflection of what people think of someone who's meek. That's our dictionary catching up with people's, people's uh, despising of someone who has this meek attitude, this meek spirit. And meekness is not power. Meekness is simply power under control. And uh, people today perceive meekness as weakness. But, and so it's despised, it's looked down upon. They're thought to be weak, but in the Bible, when we think of people that are meek, we are not thinking of weak people, okay? Moses was the meekest man in all the earth, the Bible says. The meekest man in all the earth. And yet, nobody saw God's power work through him like Moses did. Nobody saw God working that way as Moses did when, through God's power, he saw the ten plagues brought down on Egypt through God's power, he saw the Red Sea parted. Through God's power, he saw all these different miracles all his life. Oh, but he's a weak man. No, he's meek. He's not weak. How can I prove to you that meekness is not weakness? Because Jesus, our Savior, is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. There is none as powerful as him. And yet... He described himself as meek and lowly in heart. And Paul addresses them with meekness, with gentleness. Softly he talks to them. But let's not forget that Paul has power, spiritual power. He was strong in the spirit. 
He was, had great spiritual power, and yet he was meek. Meekness is not weakness. And so Paul's power is declared in verses 1 and 2. You see there how Paul addresses them in meekness, but he reminds them that he could be bold when he's present with that confidence, wherewith he thinks to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Yes, I'm meek, but listen, if I, if I, got, to, if I got to be bold, I will. If I, if I have to speak up, if I have to address this issue in person, I'm not afraid to do it. And uh, Paul's power was declared. And then verses 3 to 5, we see his power displayed. The display of his power. Verse 3, we're reminded that we are in a spiritual warfare. It says in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Christian, let's just not be fooled, okay? We're in a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual fight. 2 Timothy chapter 2 tells us that we are soldiers. We are called to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6 and other epistles tell us to put our armor on. We're in a battle for the Lord. And Jesus spoke that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And what he means there is that the gates of hell wouldn't be able to stop it as his church is built. It was a spiritual battle. And Paul was a champion in this battle. He was a victor, to say the least. He was fighting the good fight of faith. He was, as the text said, he was pulling down the strongholds of Satan as he was carrying the gospel into heathen lands, starting churches, and was used of God to... Build, build the, that church and the gates of hell couldn't stop it. He was a warrior for Christ, a warrior for the fight. And yet the battle, of course, is not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. We, though we walk in the flesh, we live in these fleshly bodies. We do not war after the flesh. And the Corinthians, the Corinthians that are being addressed they were looking at Paul according to the flesh. They were looking at him according to man's measurement. They were looking at him based on maybe his height. Paul means little. Did you know that that's what his name means? His name was Saul. Saul uh, just means ass, but it was a Jewish name. He, his name changes somewhere along the line to Paul. And Paul means little. And uh, it's believed he wasn't a big man. And they were looking at him saying, there's that little Paul. They're telling us, T telling us these things and telling us that, that we need to stop doing this sin and we got to get right in this area. And look at that little guy trying to speak against us. And Paul's like, this isn't about the flesh. This isn't about our physical bodies. This is about the spirit. We're in a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual fight. And in verse 4, he describes his weapons of warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not, when it comes to doing the work of God, you're not going to get it done with, a chari with charisma or with good looks or with um, your physical strength. The things that will be accomplished for God for eternity, they're accomplished through the power of the Spirit. They're accomplished through the Spirit of God and laboring in the spiritual realm. The weapons aren't carnal, they are, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There's power there. I mean, that power, that, that's where it's at. Tell me of that power that's mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. I mean, don't you want that power today? What Christian would sit there and say, I, I mean, I don't want that power. I mean, that, that's good to hear about. It's nice to know that that power is available to me, but I'm not interested in that kind of power. I don't want that. Really, you don't want that? Every Christian wants to see God's power in their lives. 
And when we think of God's power, we think of his power to do the impossible. We think of his mountain-moving power. We think of the power that David possessed when he fought Goliath. We think of the power with Moses when he lifted up that rod and parted the sea. We think of the power of Joshua when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. That's the power we think of. And with David, we pray in the Psalms, Psalm 63, 1, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, we want to see his power. And I love what kind of power we're talking about when you see this through. The weapons of God are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Notice this, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Where is the power seen? The power is seen in the power that it takes to save a lost soul. That's the power we're talking about. Lots of times you'll hear these verses preached and taught based on you know, controlling your thought life and bringing every one of your thoughts into captivity. And uh, that's a good verse to look at there. And if you have problems with your thought life, 2 Corinthians 10.5, that's a good verse to, to memorize. But that's not the context here. The context here is the power that it takes to save a lost soul. Paul is speaking of his power to the Corinthians. Speaking of the power, what, how do you know that Paul is an adequate missionary? How do you know that he's an adequate apostle? Paul says, hey, just look at the souls that God has used me to bring to Christ. He'll go on to say in this text that, you know, you were some of these souls. The power God has given me speaks to itself. Christian, this is the power we should crave. The power to be a soul winner. The power to be someone that can tell others about the Savior. Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all, in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the power that we're thinking of. And when Paul speaks of his power and the weapons of his warfare and what they do, this is what he speaks of. He has weapons that are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. People that you would never have thought of to, would become Christians. People that you looked at and you said, that person, he's as, he's as lost as, it, as can be. He's living, people as such as the people that live in cities like Corinth. People who are living in sin and wantonness and pleasures and had a stronghold of sin in their lives, you'd call it. But Paul came and preached the gospel. He preached Christ and him crucified. And souls were saved and the strongholds were pulled down. You think of areas in the world where paganism has a stronghold or a false religion has a stronghold and a missionary goes with the gospel of Christ to a city like Thessalonica where they worship Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. And that's who they, that's who they looked to. That's who they, that, that's who they worshiped and adored. But in that city, souls were saved. And a church was planted. And this is the power of the gospel. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the, power, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And Paul speaks of these weapons here that cast down imaginations. That's literally reasonings. It's the word for imagination is, the, is from the root word for logos, and it speaks of the arguments that men would make against the gospel. It speaks of the false systems of religion and the false systems of philosophy that men quote it to oppose Christianity. The high, every high thing would speak of the greatest of those, the greatest uh, arguments that they might have against the gospel. But Paul comes through the power of God, and he sees those strongholds pulled down. 
He sees that they're not able to resist the wisdom with which he spake. You think of Stephen standing there before the Sanhedrin, giving witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has power, so much power, that their imaginations, their high thoughts, uh, their different things that they're speaking against him, they're not able to withstand his words. There's no argument that they have to refute the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Paul's day, Adam Clark describes how the Greek philosophers, they valued themselves, especially on their ethic systems, in which their reasonings appeared to be very profound and conclusive, but they were obliged to assume principles which were either such as did not exist or were false in themselves, as the whole of their mythological system most evidently was. Truly, from what remains of them, we see that their... That they were, that their philosophy was in general good for nothing. And when the apostles came against their gods, many, and their lords, many, with the one supreme and eternal being, they were confounded, scattered, annihilated. When they came against their various modes of purifying the mind, their sacrificial meditorial system with the Lord Jesus Christ, his agony and bloody sweat, his cross and passion, his death and burial, and his glorious resurrection and ascension, they sunk before them and appeared to be what they really were as dust upon the balance and lighter than van vanity. And even the pretendedly sublime doctrines, for instance, of Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics in general, fell before the simple preaching of Christ crucified. Mm -hmm. You say, they all came tumbling, tumbling down through the preaching of the gospel. People look at Paul and they say, Paul, you have no power. You're a weak man, Paul. Where's your strength? Where's your power? They say, my power is in the gospel. That's where my power is. The Lord sent me to go to a place called Philippi where there was no Christians, never been there before. And I preached and a church was started. Then I went to a place called Corinth, a place that was so sinful, so wicked. And a church was started. People were saved out of paganism, saved out of idolatry, saved out of drunkenness. Through the mighty power of God. That's the kind of weapons we have. They're not carnal weapons. They're not the weapons of the flesh, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The picture there is once you've pulled down the strongholds, then you're leading those people into another stronghold. This time it's the obedience of Christ. Now they're saved. Now they're saved as they're living for the Savior. And their thoughts now are in obedience to Him through the preaching of the gospel. That's where the power is. I don't say that Christian doesn't have power. Christian has the power of the gospel needs to preach the gospel. That's where the power is. Preach the cross. That's where the power is. Preach the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. And we see the power of Paul. He declared it, then he displayed it by showing them how he cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. But then number three, we, or big letter C, sorry, we see the due date of his power. The due date. You know, when's your assignment due? Or when's your, or maybe you'd call it a report card day. The kids now have finished school and they're looking forward to report card day. And uh, Paul is now speaking in verse 6. He's spoken of his power there and casting down imaginations. And then he says, and having any, any readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In other words, oh, by the way, I'm equipped to deal with this too. I'm equipped, the Lord has given me power to deal with false teachers as he's dealing with here in Corinth, to deal with these accusers who would cause divisions in the church. God's given me that power too, he says. I am ready to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And so that's the due date of his power. If he has to, Paul will come, although meekly, he'll come in power and boldness to display at Corinth and to get the church, get, get deal with these 
false teachers that are there in the church. That's the power of Paul. And then number two, I want you to see the authority of Paul. The authority of Paul. In verses 7 to 11. Do ye look on these on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him or himself think this again, that he is Christ, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. That's an accusation they've made against him, that he terrifies them by letters. I mean, 1 Corinthians, that was a pretty weighty letter. I'm not going to lie. But uh, I think we'd all understand it was a letter that needed to be written. And they said in verse 10, For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. That such and one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will be also indeed when we are present. Here we see the authority of Paul. And we see big letter A here, the source of his authority. In verse 7, he's speaking to these Corinthians, and he's like, do you guys still, you guys still look at things from the outward appearance? You know how kids are today, and they, they hear, uh, Michael probably hears me say some things, and he thinks, man, alive, pastor, like, that's so 90s, or that's so, you know, long ago, that's so outdated. Well, that's how Paul is talking to these Corinthians here. You, do you still judge things by the flesh? Really? Is that how you still are? You still look at things how you looked at them like way long ago, back in the back in the age of the law, back in those days? We're in the age of grace. We're, we're not looking at we're not looking at the outward appearance. And even then it wasn't supposed, supposed to be the outward appearance. He says, if any man trusts himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. You say you're of Christ, you say you're living for the Lord. Well, so are we. You don't have anything on us there, okay? Oh, but you have letters of commendation we saw in chapter 3. You got these letters from Jerusalem. Well, in verse 8, Paul, he's not boasting of his authority because he doesn't want to be ashamed, as you see in the text. But he does remind them of his authority. You got your letters of recommendation from Jerusalem? Well, he says, For though I should boast somewhat of our authority, which the Lord hath given us. What's the source of Paul's authority? Why does... Why, why is Paul the one that wrote this letter to Corinth? Why is Paul the one that wrote the letter to Timothy and to Titus? Why did Paul write so many of these epistles in our Bibles? Because God told him to. Because Jesus was his authority. Jesus gave him the authority to do so. And he was inspired of God to write those letters. And he was speaking on behalf of the Lord. And you see that his source of authority is Jesus himself. And we think number two here, big letter B, of the purpose of his authority. The purpose of his authority. What's the purpose of it? I mean, when somebody has authority, they think it's and so that other people can serve them. That seems to be what the Judaizers thought that Paul was dealing with. So that other people can do things for us. It's so that we can lord over other people. So that we can destroy people when they do wrong. No. What's the purpose of the authority? For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us, notice, for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. What's the purpose of the authority? It's for edifying. For edifying the church. For edifying the body of Christ. And Paul says, that's, that's what I'm interested in here. You know, I'm, I'm looking to edify the Corinthians. I'm looking to edify you. I'm looking to build you up in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so it is with leaders in the church. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why did he give pastors to the local church? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's interesting how those verses kind of go along with our verses. Here we see Paul is here to edify this church, and he'll go into his measure 
a little later on, and that's big letter, or Roman numeral number three is the measure of Paul. There's no way we're bidding that far tonight. But um, we see the, uh, the purpose was to build up the church. The purpose of the pastor is to build up the church, not destroy the body of Christ, but to build it up. And that's a good thought for all of us to remember. Any one of God's people that have some form of authority, for a father in the home, for each one in, in the, for, for those that have authority in any position, in any place. Remember, the purpose of authority is to build someone up, to help those uh, who are under that authority to grow in the Lord. And so then we see, big letter C here, the exercise, the exercising of his authority. And see, is in verse number 9 to 11. It says, I'm not, that, I'm not, that I should not be ashamed, that, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. He's dealing with what they say of him again. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. That such and one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. Paul says, when I come back, if I have to exercise my authority, then I will. Uh, it's not what I want to do, but ultimately Paul would do it. Uh, you think the letters are weighty? When I come, my deeds will be weighty and powerful, just as my letters are supposedly weighty and powerful in your, the way you're looking at them. And Paul was willing to exercise his authority to protect the church. Don't you see that? He wasn't all about Paul and I'm the leader and do exactly as I say as some think a leader should be. No, that wasn't Paul. He led gently and in meekness when he had to be, when it was necessary to protect the flock, flock and to deal with false teachers. And he was ready to, to exercise the authority that God had given him. It's a good lesson for a young pastor like myself. It's a good lesson for parents. It's a good lesson for anyone who is a leader for the cause of Christ. Know when and how to exercise your authority. Make sure you look out for the flock. Make sure you look out for those that God has given to your care. And when it's time to act, make sure you act on their behalf. Paul, he ultimately wanted them to get right today, you know? He didn't want to have to go there and correct them then. He wanted them to get right right now. But if he had to, he would deal with it then. We're not going to go any further tonight in this passage of scripture, but uh, we've got so many, we still got six verses left and right, right at the end of a Roman numeral. So we'll save that for next week. Next week, we'll look at the measure of Paul as we conclude this. But you say, Pastor Luke, what in the world did that all have to do with meekness? I mean, we saw Paul's power. We saw Paul's authority. What does that have to do with meekness? Well, meekness is all in how you use the power and authority that you have. That's what meekness is. Meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is referring to someone that has the power, and they use it in a gentle way. And Paul is addressing people that are against him, people that have spoken harshly about him, and you see how he's so controlled in his response. You see how he is so meek and gentle as he deals with it, as he's dealt with them in the past. That's their accusation is his meekness. And he's willing to be meek again. But he will ultimately deal with them if he has to. And Paul was a man of great power. And perhaps the greatest strength he had was his ability to rule his own spirit ever thought of that? We look at someone like Samson, and we say, man alive, Samson was strong. Samson was a mighty man. He could lift up the bars of the city and just, uh, the gate of the city, and just walk away with them. He could just lean against the pillars of a building and just bring the whole place down. Samson was a strong man. But God looks at a man like Paul and says, there's a better man than Samson. There's a mightier man than Samson. Proverbs 16, 32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. 
Self-control. Have meekness. Control your strength. And that's, that's a quality to be esteemed. That's something that we ought to want to have. And church, I wonder, will you pray for me, for, with me for meekness? Will you pray for yourself for meekness? I want to be meek like our Savior. And I trust that each one of us will desire to be like Christ today, to be meek just like him. He said, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You say that about yourself. We're thinking of the heart of a preacher, but really the heart of any Christian. We should have that meek and lowly heart. Do you have that today? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your word. Thank you, Lord, for these verses that we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I pray, Lord, that they'll be a blessing to us. I pray, Lord, that if there's someone that is uh, wanting to be, I pray that all of us will want to have this meekness, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us all in this area. And I pray that if there's someone that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior that's listening tonight, I pray that that one will be saved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so next week, there's only about, tonight we've preached 11 verses. Next week we'll preach, I think it's 7 verses. So next week's message should be a lot shorter than this week's message. But good luck with that. It never seems to go that way. But <laughs> just saying. <laughs> um, well, we're going to have prayer time here. How we're going to do it is I'm going to close our video in prayer. And then we're going to take requests from the floor and have a prayer time here. But um, just so you know, the uh, so some updates first. I did get a prayer letter from the Buckinghams and a prayer letter from the Grinsteads, and they'll both be posted to this video link, so all those watching can, can click on that and, and read that. Um, and then the big prayer request that we have uh, these days is uh, just the arrangements for Brother Dan, and uh, just still working on that. Talk to a public trustee person today. Talk to um, someone from community services today about finances, and I believe it's all going to be worked out. But just keep praying about it until you know until it is all worked out. But um, pray for that. And I have a, I have a praise tonight, and that uh, my stepfather Leron, he they took him back at the Chronicle Herald. And so he's got his job back. And so I think all four people that we had under employment needs at this time during the COVID time, um, all four of them have been hired back on or something like that. So I just, that's a big praise. And uh, thank the Lord that Leron has his job again at the Chronicle Herald. So um, I'm going to close this in prayer and then we'll have a prayer time here. And I hope that you have a prayer time there at home. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the night we've had in your house. Thank you, Lord, for um, just the, your goodness to us and uh, your kindness. And thank you, Lord, for um, all the many blessings that you give us day by day. Thank you, Lord, that even though we are um, have strict rules, thank you that we're able to have 10 people in, Lord. That's more than we were able to have last week or two weeks ago, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord, for that. And I pray, Lord, that the numbers will increase and soon we'll be able to have everybody in for our services. Pray, Lord, for the parking lot service on Sunday, that it will go well. Pray, Lord, that it will be an encouragement to each one that's there. And I pray that uh, we'll see you working there. I pray, Lord, for, um, I pray, Lord, for uh, the arrangements for our brother Dan. I just ask, Lord, that you will um, help, give guidance and direction to uh, myself and brother Duran who's doing so much and for, um, and for others, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord, to know um, what to do, what to say to who, and all these different things. And I pray, Lord, that you'll work it all out. I pray, Lord, for... Um, thank you, Lord, for the praise that Leron has been hired back at the Chronicle Herald. And thank you, Lord, for that all the four that were on our list for employment needs at this time have been hired back. And I didn't even, don't even think I put Rachel on the list as well, Lord, but she was hired back too at Michael's. And just thank you, Lord, for all of that. And pray that you'll bless in each one in our, our church, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you'll meet our needs at this time. And I pray, Lord, for... Um, just pray for the virus, Lord, that it will go away, that we'll um, see all our liberties restored, Lord. And I pray that you'll help us, Lord, at this time to be where you want us to be, doing what you want us to do. 
and I pray that we will be faithful to you at this time and remember to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and I pray that we will um, that our lives will be pleasing to you pray for um, for each one in our church for health needs that you meet each one pray for um, pray Lord for the racial tension across our country and the world today pray Lord for peace pray Lord for um, just pray that people will see the wonderfulness of the gospel Lord how in Christ um, all of these things disappear and I pray that we'll see souls come to know Jesus as their Savior pray Lord for um, each one our, our missionaries Lord for the Grinsteads and the Vince Littles and the Buckinghams and the Brennamores and the People's Gospel Hour Lord pray for each one of them Lord that you'll meet their needs Lord pray that you'll work in each heart and life and I pray uh, that you'll use them for the saving of lost souls and I pray, Lord, that you'll be with us tonight, bring us home safely, and back again for Sunday morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.